Religion, Reason, and Theology Live. The show concentrates on theological topics, historical matters, and philosophical problems with content ranging from introductory material to in-depth examinations. And now, your host, Michael Lofton. Welcome back, everybody. Your host, Michael, on a Friday evening, getting back into the swing of things this week with our shows, bringing on here in just a moment, Eric Ibarra and also Dr. Daniel Haynes, who uh, graduated with his uh, Doctor of Philosophy degree from the University of Nottingham and wrote his dissertation on our topic today, which is Grace and Metaphysics and St. Maximus the Confessor. Really looking forward to hearing uh, more about that and, you know, other endeavors that he's uh, been engaged with when it comes to uh, St. Maximus the Confessor. So bringing both of them coming up next. <laughs> Dr. Daniel Haynes, how are you? I'm doing well, sir. How are you? I'm doing well, very well. And good to, good to have you on the show. And Eric, how are you? Oh, I'm doing excellent. Uh, it's nice to uh, carve out some free time to get back on. It's been a right. little while, right? It's been a little while. Say, maybe three, three weeks or so. I, I don't know. Four Somewhere. weeks, something like that. Three yeah, or four something weeks. Something like yeah. that. It's been a while. <laughs> yeah, we. Fair we've warning, been... gentlemen. There is a storm where I live, so if my internet goes out, I'll have to. Oh uh, well, I know all about that. <clears throat> yeah, we're we yeah we we've had our storms. <laughs> so, yeah, I live in a rural yeah. area, so it's it's kind of like that. So. Yeah. yeah, well, this is the first evening that it hasn't rained in quite a while, so yes. uh, hopefully I'll be good on my end and it won't get struck by lightning as I almost did on one show. Oh, really? I that was fun. On, you were on what? Matt Fred's show. Yeah. Uh, he, yeah. You were on Matt Fred's show, and there was like uh, World War Three going yeah. on outside. <laughs> Not oh only goodness. that, but lightning struck right outside my office and zapped me in the ear it went i don't know through the soundboard and zapped me then my headphones it yeah wow. it was it was a really interesting experience trying Scary. to uh you know discuss theology when you hear a war going on but anyways we're here to talk about you and your dissertation so let's talk about grace and metaphysics in saint maximus the confessor but you know before we dive into the topic itself why don't you maybe just tell us a little bit about yourself uh, as far as background yeah, sure. Um, so I am a, a fairly recent Catholic uh, convert uh, to the faith. Um, and uh, the uh, 2020, during the uh, disease that we cannot speak of, um, mm -hmm. I was confirmed. And um, I grew up Baptist, of all things, and uh, had a wonderful upbringing uh, that way. But then in college, and then particularly going into my master's uh, at Baylor University of Divinity, um, I thought I was going to go into ministry. I uh, started reading patristics. We had to do a module on the church fathers. And I'm like, well, who are these guys? And uh, eventually I made it into the Episcopal church uh, or the Anglican tradition uh, because my step-grandmother was uh, Episcopalian. And uh, so I was familiar with that. You know, we went to the Christmas Eve mass, you know, every year. It was just like lovely candles and all that. So I uh, really got onto the uh, liturgical uh, kind of trajectory that way. And I was... Uh, uh, then I got my, uh, went, graduated from Baylor in 2006, and then uh, after my wife finished her master's, uh, we uh, went to England, and I studied at the University of Nottingham uh, under the Eastern Orthodox scholar uh, Mary Cunningham, mm -hmm. and also uh, uh, John Milbank. Um, he was my secondary advisor, and he was also my internal examiner, um, and uh really the impetus for a lot of my thinking uh, metaphysically uh, about how to approach this issue. Um, and plus he's just a wealth of resources for neoplatonism. Mm. Right. Um, it, he's a very impressive person to be around. So, <laughs> um, uh, so I had that experience and then I, I graduated in uh, 2012 uh, with my PhD uh, in theology of Maximus. Um, and so when I was in uh, my master's, and I'm still Anglican at this time. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I read the, the Paul Bloor's book, uh, The Mystery, uh, The Incarnation of uh, mm -hmm. the Cosmic Mystery of Jesus Christ. Uh, and I was, I was reading Maximus. I was just blown away by how rich the, the cosmic vision of theology was. You know, in, as in the Anglican tradition, you know, because we have that Celtic, we had that Celtic kind of uh, background that kind of really jived the spirituality, especially. And I read um, Alexander Schmemann's For the Life of the World. 
uh, and that really kind of hooked me on uh, that kind of cosmic vision where God was not estranged from the world. Um, and so I wanted to do my dissertation on him, but I was a little naive because uh, I didn't realize how complicated Max was, right? Mm. Um, yes, yes. Um, he's so rich and so wonderful. You could spend your you know entire life trying to understand this man. And he's not a systematic thinker, so that makes it even more uh, interesting to chew through. His, his Greek is very difficult, and, uh, and there's very little English translations, really, of his works. They're starting to come out now, though. Uh, but uh, then uh, a couple of years ago, I kind of started the journey towards um, Catholicism, and I joined um, the Ordinariate Diocese uh, established by Pope Benedict uh, the 16th. And um, I really loved that because it was a way to kind of, because I was thoroughly Anglican to my core and my traditions and things mm. and my way of thinking. And so that was just a perfect fit uh, to be able to do that. And um, I convinced my former <laughs> priest uh, and about 22 others uh, from the parish to come with me. And uh, I sponsored them all. <laughs> and wow. uh, we came wow. in and faith. we had another round, uh, including my sister and her family uh, came in uh, at Easter this year. Um, we've got to bring them into the church as well. And we are uh, starting, we just found that we are the newest Catholic church uh, in the world. Uh, we founded um, a church in uh, just south of Gainesville, Georgia, and Oakwood, uh, St. Margaret of Scotland uh, Catholic Church in its ordinary parish. And uh, we've got a building. Now we're going to start worshiping soon. How do you know that you're the newest Catholic church in the world? I'm just trying to. I was told by Bishop Lopes that we were, you know, wow, so really? I, I awesome. believe his excellency awesome. when he says yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> That's my bishop as well. So I'll take his word for it. So. <laughs> yes. Um, that's great. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of my background. I, so I, I kind of, I've crossed both sides of the aisle there. I even I had several friends actually in college um, who uh, kind of drank the Orthodox Kool-Aid. You know, because there was a, I, I lived in Dallas at the time, I live north of Atlanta now, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's the cathedral there uh, for the Orthodox Church in America. And it's, it was lovely. They, the evening vespers was so mystical, you know, with the candles and everything. So um, I, I, I kind of dabbled in Eastern Orthodoxy at that time. But, of course, um, with time, I saw the, the issues with that, uh, the Eastern Orthodoxies um, mm. the world. So... Now we we have a lot of commonality there, um, you know. I'm looking yeah, at we the all have school. commonality with the ordinary too. All of us here sitting yeah. here are so involved. You're, uh, in the Eric, you're in the ordinary yeah. as well. Yeah, all my kids are baptized into it. I came out of uh, the APA, Anglican Province of America, uh, right? Um, and so I was under Bishop Grundorf. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh yeah so uh, right now i'm not attending one because i don't i, I moved away from my home parish uh right. back in orlando but that's that's my home parish still so. yeah. Well, wonderful yeah that's been my issue too because uh, my home parish for a while was in athens was uh, like an hour and a half away from me so yeah my, I, I don't have a home <laughs> parish that's ordinary i'm a member of the ordinary but just go to regular Latin right church. So, right. Nice. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, that's pretty awesome. We all have the same Bishop, but we're all, all three spread out in very, <laughs> very different places. Right. Kind of, un kind of unusual, but that's the personal ordinary. So, all right, well, let's uh, talk about the dissertation itself. I'm looking through the table of contents here and what first jumps out at me is the essence and energies distinction. Right. Oh, this so, is a very complex topic. Uh, could you is, break it break it down for us? Talk to us. I about. can break it down. I don't know if we're going to solve the problem tonight. Um, sure. uh, there's, there's, there's some ongoing debate about it since it's officially, you know, kind of declared through three councils in the East that uh, the right. Palamite is the doctrine. So, um, yeah, when I got into uh, when I was reading the uh, Paul Blower's translation, and uh, there was Maximus kept talking about grace. I was like, oh, I thought he was a an Eastern Orthodox, uh, Eastern, you know, thinker. Uh, so what's he doing talking about grace? And then Paul Blower has a nice little footnote that says, now we shouldn't, um, you know, import the, the Western dialectic of uh, grace and nature here for Maximus. I was thinking, oh, that's an interesting question. I wonder if anybody's, you know, done a dissertation on that. So that was kind of the impetus of it. Um, and as I, you know, studied more and more, of course, I looked at the, um, What's really important to look at the thinkers, look at their 
background, <laughs> their, their cultural context. And of course, the, the, the Neoplatonic philosophy uh, was in the background. For Maximus, it was probably more through Dionysius, uh, through Dionysius, uh, that he got the Neoplatonic philosophy, particularly of Iamblichus and Proclus. Um, and, but then when I started to look at the SS energy distinction, I was reading Palamas' interpretation. I was reading a lot of like Meindorf and other Eastern thinkers on the topic and the way that they were reading uh, the distinction. Um, it is a little bit problematic because it came across as uh, overly Platinian. Uh, and so uh, what some of the errors, I think, on both sides, the East and West, in understanding this issue is that uh, we kind of lump Neoplatonism in kind of a, a single kind of column and category. And there are a lot of different nuances. Uh, you know, the Athenian school was different. Um, um, and so um, I wanted to look at the background for that because uh, especially when you get Gregory of Nyssa, now he's definitely very much more highly influenced in his theology uh, by the Platinian idea because he has that uh, epic you know, that, that perpetual ascent, the one beyond everything. So there's this, the, the vision of, final vision of God is never ending, right? Um, in that sense. Um, but and that is the kind of the idea of a Plotinus, um, who's the, you know, kind of the head dominant thinker of the Neoplatonic school. Of course, it's all anachronistic, right? They didn't call themselves Neoplaton Neoplatonists, right? <laughs> um, and, uh, for, for Plotinus, he has, you know, the one, and then he has these emanations from the one, um, you know, mind and delight, et cetera. And, uh, and then that keeps spilling on down into the chains, into, um, down even to the, you know, the finite world. And so the whole idea of um, philosophy, contemplation, and um, even, you know, third kind of practices, magical practices, was the whole idea of trying to elevate the, the soul and return back to the one, to that one principle. Um, so that was in the background uh, for some of the church fathers. But then when we get to Dionysius, um, and Dionysius is so important because he really is kind of the foundation of both um, you know, later for uh, Boethius and then Aquinas in understanding uh, how do we talk about God? Yeah, how do we uh, give God's attributes and his names? I want to give you a chance to jump in here, Eric, at this time. Any thoughts or comments that you have so far? No, I, I, I mean, all I could say is that I echo what you're saying, uh, Daniel, I, I, in my own research. Um, you know, at first, I I was reading some of the authors who didn't want to connect Maximus to Neoplatonic thought, um, right. and uh, and they kind of have that sense of being like more faithful to Maximus, but um, it's just too unavoidable. Some of the clear yeah. statements, clear. almost like cut and paste, right? And then right. from from Dionysius, and then Dionysius is almost like cut and paste. From, and Maximus uh, cites him, you know, as especially in the mystagogy, you know, his mystagogy is a whole meditation on Dionysius' celestial hierarchy. Um, yeah, so it's unavoidable. I think it's unavoidable. Right. Yeah, it is. So the question is, um, you know, there's kind of two set, you know, schools of thought. Are they just borrowing a lot of the language? Uh, you know, there's, that's kind of the popular uh, orthodox saying. Oh, they just kind of borrow popular languages from the day. They didn't really necessarily mean these philosophical uh, things. Um, you know, and the other is, um, you know, oh, they're just slapping Christ on top of Neoplatonism and, you know, <laughs> basically, <Yeah>. you know, <laughs> you know uh, that's what they're doing. That's kind of the other extreme, uh, you know, kind of uh, side of it. Um, but then in the, um, when I, uh, I forgot to say in my intro, when I did in, um, in, when I was in England in 2011, I organized a conference at Oxford. Um, every four years they helped hold an international patristics conference there. And I had kind of a meeting and colloquium. It was like a three day thing. I had a huge list of speakers, Orthodox um, and Western. Um, I had Andrew Louth, Callistos Ware. I had um, David Bradshaw, uh, who y'all, I don't know if you've had him on your show before. You should get him on. Uh, he's excellent. We've had Bradshaw, yeah. Callistos okay, Ware, all of those. Yeah. Right. Um, but then uh, I also had Western scholars. I had Rowan Williams um, and, um, also John Milbank, uh, doing the presentations, um, as well. And, oh, in that, in that list was, uh, Milbank's article, which is an essay, really, it was, it's very long, uh, you know, probably about 80 pages, uh, of the book, but he really kind of goes in and says, 
um, the problem actually is understanding uh, Neoplatonism because especially we see the 20th century you have like uh, Gilles Son and, uh, and others uh, in these schools, they're looking at the Neoplatonists and they're saying, oh, well, they have these uh, kind of realities that are reified in between God and the, and the created world. Um, and so uh, they call it that henology, uh, henatology, um, based on the henads, which are these uh, these other ontological uh, realities that come off of the one in between the one and created world that are the material world. And, um, and so that's a little bit too simplistic uh, I, of an idea, even in, in Proculus um, himself. Because um, in Iamblichus and the Athenian school itself, they explicitly kind of reject this separation of uh, essence and energy, activity and in, in essence. Um, quite clear, you look at uh, Gersh's study on Neoplatonism uh, to, to, to see that reference. But it, it's quite it's quite clear. And so if we understand um, participation, not as uh, a lot of people have the problem with participation because it makes you feel like you know, like if you have a pizza, you take a slice out of it. Right. Oh, I'm, I'm participating. I'm eating the piece of the pizza. I'm participating in. But that's that's not uh, metaphysically kind of what Proclus especially is trying to do. Um, it's not that uh, th there's usually three stages. There is the imparticipable, which is like the head of the series. Um, uh, it'd be the one, the, the one above everything, uh, the unified. And then you have um, the uh, uh, participated, that is that, that sharing that is participated by the lower levels. And then you have the uh, participant. Okay, So that's usually a triad. And Dionysius and Maximus both repeat that, that, that triad. Um, and that's how uh, most Orthodox thinkers kind of reading Palamas back into uh, Dionysius and Maximus, uh, they want to say, aha, that, that middle term, uh, the, the participated, which is not a part of the imparticipatable, and uh, it's not you know, the participant, it's this other thing that the participant participates in. Mm -hmm. And so they said that's the essence and energy is kind of distinction. There's an ontological kind of distinction there in God. Uh, but the problem with that is that we believe in creation ex nihilo. <laughs> uh, and so the created order is uh, other, wholly other uh, than God. Um, but I can understand Palamas's later um, desire, I think it's an earnest, honest desire and intention to explain how in his spiritual practice, hesychism, which was like a, a kind of a contemplative, almost Zen kind of like practice of re, uh, doing the Jesus prayer um, on uh, Mount Athos in that school of thought, uh, they're trying to defend themselves and explain how they have these uh, essentially mystical experience of God where they can see uh, realities of God um, with spiritual eyes or with their their physical eyes, if you want to um, think about it. And so he's trying to justify that and explain it. But he, he does, a, even though he's well-educated, he doesn't do a very consistent job of defending that and explaining how that is. He runs into lots of uh, kind of contradictions when he tries to, uh, you know, explain how the God can be both be his essence is not participatable, but yet his actions or energies in the world is able to be participated in, um, even though I can understand the, the the sentiment. So, for instance, I, I kind of jotted a couple of them down uh, in the triads. Um, Palamas uh, in triad two, uh, three, two, nine, he attributes omnipresence with divine energies and not with the divine <laughs> senses. Oh, <sorry>, my dog. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> no, Romeo. No, that's okay. Yeah, I remember I remember going through the you know the, the triads and uh, there's just some there's some huge zingers that Palamas gives that just makes you stop. Like, wait a minute, is he really making this out to be equal with uncreated, you know, Right. He's really trying to say this has no beginning. Right, right. He's really trying to say it doesn't have a beginning. Um, and, and and that's why it's real tricky when we get to Maximus, because um, we'll talk about how there's there's some really seems like some silver bullets for the Orthodox in, in some of uh, passages of Maximus. I want to uh, address those as well. But so the whole idea is that um, one of God's defining attributes is omnipresence is only a part of his energies. It's not part of his essence. So he doesn't have that. Um, what Aquinas would say, you know, later the uh, the infinite essay, you know, the fullness uh, of being in that sense. Um, 
And then he also says that uh, some energies have a beginning and some do not, um, which kind of parallels Maximus there in one, in one place, particularly his chapters on knowledge in the first century. I'll look at those texts in just a second. Um, and then he also says that uh, in his uh, 150 chapters that he wrote outside the triads, he says that there is uh, something which is not uh, – the way he tries to talk about um, God's energies, it tries to seem, seems like God has something that's not his substance. So like, so what is that? Uh, and he also tries to, he tries to maybe kind of, he calls it even a, a quasi accident, even though it's not, um, which it gets into some really murky uh, theology there. And then it also creates some issues with Trinitarian theology. Uh, he says that um, the, uh, the Godhead has three realities, substance, energy, and Trinity. So is the essence of God above the Trinity? Um, <laughs> that was one of the questions that I've had in my reading of Palamas. Mm -hmm. And I, I mm -hmm. yeah, um, I, and I haven't really found a, a solid answer there. What has what your research yielded? Yeah, um, when, when looking at it, I mean, it, did, it seems like he's saying that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that it could open his system the way that he has it framed. Uh, it could be understand that way if you want to push that negative theology um, kind of barometer so far uh, to the other end. And, um, and then another place uh, in um, the chapters, of, uh, 150 chapters, uh, chapter 135, he says that the divine will is distinct from the divine nature. And so, but it's still fully God. Um, so that that's kind of problematic. <laughs> uh, um, and it even says that, uh, this is where he talks about language. You can kind of uh, pick up a what we call a formal distinction. So in metaphysics, we might have a real distinction uh, that is like you know, God and yep. creation are real distinctions. They're distinct. A formal distinction is kind of in between. Um, it's, it's a right. causative distinction. Um, and then he's, he says that um, divine foreknowledge is distinct from divine will. Uh, and he says the reason for this is because uh, God would foreknow evil in advance and he wouldn't will that. And so he couldn't, they couldn't possibly be the same as the essence. So he's creating distinctions in God uh, between his uh, willing and knowing. Um, so again, there's just a lot of these uh, problematic issues uh, in his own text. And Milbank in his article uh, makes a wonderful trajectory. So I encourage everyone to read it uh, where he kind of says, you know, even this is even pointed out by scholars at the same time that the um, disputes were taking place about the Palamite controversy um, uh, right in the early 1300s. There was a parallel um, kind of dispute uh, going on in the West um, between kind of the uh, with Duns Scotus and some of the Franciscans. And so there's there's he kind of points out a little bit of a parallel there where um, the, the Scotus kind of um, elevation of God's infinity to being his primary attribute um, and also his idea of concept of university of being. Um, and, and Scotus also has a, a distinction, a formal distinction, his ontology, um, where that kind of kind of paves the way to for kind of a similar kind of process of of uh, what we see in Palamas, where there's this ontological kind of reserve uh, that's that's not shared, and um, and so, and of course, Milbank kind of shows how in the in the future you can kind of see how all these play out, um, and even understanding this idea of participation and hierarchy, uh, especially in the mediation of that hierarchy, is really important, uh, and it spills out into you know politics as well. So uh, the whole idea in Proculan metaphysics, uh, going back to Proculus, is that uh, the one that is imparticipatable, um, it, it gives itself completely at every level down the hierarchy, um, but it is still supreme and it's higher than the effects down the hierarchy. Um, but it is still fully and wholly present at every level and it gives itself fully and wholly, even though it doesn't uh, give itself um, in its absolute nature in, in, in that sense. And, um, and for uh, 
but Proclus, unlike Plotinus, um, that uh, that uni unifying power of the of the one at the top of the chain is even present at the very, very, very bottom. Even when you get stripped everything back down to prime matter, uh, Proclus says uh, in his Elements of Theology that there is still a simplicity. There's still a unit of simplicity because of the causal nature of the one who gives. Um, and what that al allows for is that uh, God, who is imparticipable, paradoxically, this is the key actually point of the whole, my whole dissertation, <laughs> is paradoxically shared, even though he can't be shared. Um, and I just see this replete with Maximus. Um, and then when I looked at uh, Maximus's uh, other elements of his theology, particularly his uh, Trinitarian theology, um, and I look at his fundamental ontology of creation, which is the Logos and Logoi, uh, I'll talk about that because that's really the most interesting and original aspect of Maximus's theology. There's nothing of a, an ontological medium. There's no third man. There's not a reserve at all in between God and creation. Um, and also in the Trinity, Trinitarian theology. So it makes me kind of wonder, well, then why would he be have a completely different metaphysics, really, <laughs> in his understanding of uh, God's action and activity in the world in his, in his essence? So uh, let's talk about the Logos and the Logoi. So uh, Maximus calls the Logos, which we know from John 1.1, 1, 1, right? Uh, the word became flesh, right? Uh, in the beginning was the word. Um, Logos is the Greek word for word, but it can also, it has a very much a rich, like so many words in Greek, it has a rich connotation. It can be reason, will, um, active uh, uh, paradigm for things. Um, so it can mean a lot of different things. But he talks about the Logos, capital L, Jesus Christ before creation held all of the logoi, uh, which is the plural of logos. So that would be all creatures, okay? Uh, everything from, uh, you know, non-souled matter <laughs> uh, through human beings and angels, everything in creation. Even uh, universals have a, have a logos, Maximus says, a reason, a purpose, a, a will. And um, uh, all of those things are paradigmatically or as an exemplary uh, paradigm, and a blueprint, kind of like the divine ideas later in, in medieval theology, all of those are held into the logos before time. He holds them in a single unity in the logos um, before creation. Now these aren't, and he corrects uh, a movement that was attributed to origin uh, that, uh, that that motion is fallenness because uh, originally we were, uh, these little hinads, origin calls them hinads, and we were attached to the God, and uh, we, because of sin, we we broke off from God. We're, we're like a, a fragment of divinity, and we 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 fell into a created worlds. So the create that's why the, you know created matter is bad and all these things. So Maximus is trying to undo this current in his own theological milieu um, and, and counteract that. He's saying no, they aren't metaphysical. Um, uh, substances, <laughs> you know, it's not like we're a substance of God literally uh, that fell off and came into the created world. The Logoi are God's uh, reasons, his desires, his plans, his providential uh, uh, design for the entire cosmos. And uh, through contemplation, through asceticism, um, the, the Christian can meditate on these principles present in creation. So we all each have our own Logoi, our unique logoi, and uh, we can understand them better and better, and see these principles at work in the creation. Uh, kind of, kind of like the forms at work, uh, if you want to think of it in a kind of a classical Platonic kind of idea. Um, but at the same time, uh, he doesn't say that uh, the logoi on the side of God are plural; they're singular. They're logos on the side of God. But when they come into the created world, they enter time they are called the Logoi, they're pluralized. And so uh, in everything um, in the world, we get our own individuality, our own Logoi, uh, when we come into time, that's what gives us our difference, identity and difference. So Maximus kind of solves uh, the ancient philosophical question of identity and difference. You know, is, is the world one like the Buddhists say, or is it uh, reality one, or is it uh, different? And how do we connect those two? Maximus says that, 
the incarnation is the reason for the cosmos uh, and it's the reason for everything. And it was this mystery that was hidden, right? But now is revealed uh, in, in the world. So he's, he's going along a Paul line, you know, kind of trajectory, uh, trying to um, flush out, actually flush out some of Paul's um, mystical kind of teachings in the New Testament about being so Lord I who live with Christ in me um, and these types of things, the resurrection of the body. Um, and so Maximus doesn't really have, he doesn't have this ontological distinction between the Logos, Christ uh, in eternity, and the Logoi, uh, plural, in the natural world. Um, and so my dissertation looks a lot at that um, to say, well, that's that, that's that seems incongruent with a essence energy distinction um, and God's attributes and his divine nature. Um, but then uh, there is a really uh, difficult passage in uh, the chapters on knowledge. Well, wh while you're looking for that passage, yep. for um, uh, if you don't mind, Michael, I just wanted to uh, bring up uh, something about this whole issue of um, the lo uh, the Logi or the, the Logoi um, being undifferentiated in, yeah. on the side of God. Right. Um, do, do, correct me if I'm wrong, okay, but it almost seems as though uh, that would end up putting them in the essence of God, right? Or God's right. innate. Yeah. yeah. So and I, that seems to be a problem for a lot of neo palamites who um, they don't they can't have because there's got if it's undifferentiated then God doesn't have like the number one the the like some sort of potential you know and uh, way to differentiate things from one another like uh, they quote Basil Saint Basil you know on the the essence and energies in that one famous epistle of his but right. um, in in Maximus. I just can't get past the fact that for him, he really does see it un, un, undifferentiated in God. Right. When it when it comes to being perceived outside of God, then you've got the plurality. But right. the, it, it proceeds from undifferentiation. So I, I just you know that I kind of I concur with what you're saying. Obviously, you can you you're confirming the floor here, but um, I I really uh, see that Maximus. I'm not sure about Palamas and exactly where he goes and justifying this, but right, right, yeah. And if you want to think about it, it's not really that different from um, exemplarism uh, later on and the divine ideas. Um, you know, so it's the same kind of. Um, metaphysical move in a sense where they are single in God in his essence. And um, uh, Dionysius will call these like divine wills. Uh, so it's kind of uh, the, um, and they're more, more logical uh, kind of uh, realities. Uh, Maximus uses them more logical sense uh, such that uh, it's basically God's idea for the creation. And so um, on, on the other side of the creation divide, um, there's there's multiplicity, um, but it's there's diff difference from Maximus. I, I'd recommend um, uh, Torsten Tolleson's book, uh, Christocentric Cosmology and Maximus the Confessor, talks about all these metaphysical principles. It's really excellent. Um, so um, the the Logoi they have their difference, their identity. Um, on this side because they become what they are. Um, when they become what there's what God intends them to be, that gives them their differentiation. Um, and then Maximus, uh, also the other layer that's really important here to really, I think, interpret the essence energies is Maximus doesn't really ever talk about deification. So um, participating in God's energies is kind of also uh, synonymous with uh, deification in a sense. It's, it's a part of deification in uh, particularly the Eastern Fathers. But um, as a lot of research coming out in the last several, de oh, last decade, I guess, um, the you know seeing it in the West as well, um, in in Augustine and Aquinas and such. But um, so is this idea of eschatology. So Maximus um, uses a, an Aristotelian framework. Uh, so he's later on the school of thought, very much influenced by Porphyry and his school, uh, kind of redoing. Uh, aerosols categories and making them more logical categories. Um, but anyways, 
uh, Maximus has uh, kind of a triad of um, three different kinds of uh, causes of, of reality, of, of creation. And one is uh, God that gives us being. So God's our, our cause, uh, kind of like a, a formal cause there uh, of being. And then we have our um, well-being. And that is kind of us in this world trying to live out the virtues through grace. Uh, that's well-being. And then we have eternal being, which is our eternal destination. So this is resurrected life, right? Um, and as we know from Holy Scripture, um, you know, at, at the resurrection, we're going to be different. We're going to be we're going to be still physical. We're going to get our bodies back, but we're going to be changed. Paul says, and Paul has a hard time kind of describing what this resurrected body is like, right? Um, and so there's something about that. And the Maximus on his commentary on the Our Father, he gives a meditation on. Uh, our Father who art in heaven. And he, he says, you know, there has to be, you know, we know from Scripture, there there is an abode of God above time. Uh, there's heaven. <laughs> and and so what is that? How do we explain that? And he gives a little clue in his mystagogy, his meditation on the, the, the sacred mass, um, sacred liturgy. And he, he references a passage in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 1. And it was really weird. I followed the daily office in the ordinaria, and uh, yesterday was Ezekiel 1. And the reading, I was like, well, this might be providential. Uh, but Ezekiel gives this unusual vision. It's one of the most crazy visions, right, uh, in the Old Testament. And what does he see? He sees, first, he sees four creatures, right? And they have all these kind of weird faces and sides and everything. Um, and then he sees uh, a wheel, right? And what's so weird about the wheel is that it seems like a wheel is moving within a wheel. And all these creatures, when they move, they're moving and they're really fast, he says, Ezekiel says, but they didn't, they never turn. Okay. So they're doing something that is uh, not of this world, right? They're, they're, they're accomplishing movement, but they're not actually turning. It's like they're going where the spirit takes them, but they're not actually turning to follow. It's, it's like a weird, a really weird vision. And it, it gives this kind of paradoxical idea of there is what Maximus will say uh, when we're deified, we'll exist. Um, our, our, our logoi, our principle of existence, our nature won't change. We still will have a human nature, right? We'll be embodied. But he says our mode, our tropos, our mode of existence will be different. And so somehow the divine will so transfigure us, ourselves, just like Christ, um, in the eschaton, that uh, we will have a new mode of being that is above our the, the capabilities of our nature. Our soul will have... Uh, eternal blessedness, and then our bodies will be resurrected permanently and be immortal. Um, and so that's obviously above our natural capabilities, right, in, in our current life. And so um, Maximus talks about, in chapters on knowledge, uh, century 1, 48 through 50, he talks about these um, works of God, God's works. And this is always in the patristic literature, the works of God indicate creatures, God's creation. Um, but Maximus talks about two different kinds of works. There are works that began in time and those that did not begin in time. And so uh, we see the Dionysian um, uh, exemplars, uh, what Dionysius would call the Perudoi, um, that uh, so their uh, goodness, life itself, infinity, and such things, uh, which are kind of like the perfections of God, right? Um, and those are the works that did not begin in time, Maximus says. Um, and so this is uh, kind of like the the silver bullet that Orthodox will point to to say that Maximus has this these these aspects of God, and uh, he doesn't really use the singular there, and that they are they are God in a sense that they are they didn't begin in time, so they're the abode of God. And um, in my reading of uh, Dionysius and other as other all across Maximus Corpus, um, in my dissertation, I argue that. Um, we can't, because of his, uh, and he uses the, the Logos Logoi later on uh, in this chapter, and because of his Trinitarian uh, idea of the sun, the pr procession of the sun, you know, he really can't be talking about something uh, outside of God. Um, what we might be able to interpret it is the uh, eternal works of God, or the, is that abode above time that is our, our end, our destiny um, of deification. And that is not something we can, he, Maximus also has this idea of Paul, the already, but not 
quite yet. You know, we're, we're, we're living out salvation, resurrected life now, but we're not fully restored like the Corinthian letters talk about. Uh, we still wait our bodies uh, restoration, right? And so uh, Maximus uh, has that kind of motif as well. He has a really strong eschatology that informs his metaphysics. And so he says at the end of time, uh, in Ambiguum 7, um, in the Paul Bloor's book, um, when he's talking about uh, final deification, he says that the, uh, um, the only being who knows his own essence is God. God's the only being who truly knows his own essence in himself. But at the end of time, Maximus says that uh, through deification, we the, will know our logoi. God will show and reveal to us our, our logoi uh, so that we know our, our principle, our meaning of existence. And then he'll say, well, we are fully um, uh, full of divinity and uh, divinity will be ours. It says uh, we will be God. Um, but then it also makes the distinction, but you know, we won't uh, be a part of God's essence. And so um, if we think of the radical participation that we see in Proclus and, and Dionysius, I think Maximus is still in this trajectory uh, because he doesn't say um, we'll be fully God while still being fully man. Uh, you know, in his Christology, Jesus isn't 95% God and, you know, 5% man, right? Uh, it's 100%, 100%. It's something that's illogical, right? It, it, it's, it's, it's a paradox. Um, and so at the end of time, we will have this paradoxical knowing, uh, true knowledge. And Maximus says we'll have the vision of God. And our, our movement in this world will actually, we will find rest. And so in the vision of God, um, um, and he has the same kind of sense of where we will uh, see God's light and we will shine with the rays and the light of God. And so the Orthodox generally, most interpret uh, Orthodox theologians will interpret that as being the uncreated light that Palamas talks about uh, seeing. But it doesn't seem like uh, Maximus goes uh, that far because he doesn't actually say whether it's you know, created or not created, it's that we have the light of God. And he says, and we will uh, shine as if everything is the sun. And, it, and he talks about that as well in his uh, meditation on the Transfiguration, Ambiguum 10. Um, and Aquinas, when he's talking about the beatific vision, he kind of basically talks about that we will experience the genius um, of something, but not the species. So it, uh, we, and of course, the, the papal bull, right, <laughs> uh, Benedictus Deus, uh, you know, it just says we will have the immediate vision of God, well, the immediate uh, es understanding of God, presence of God, essence of God. Um, but yet we still have that perception. Uh, and so it, it's like um, a light that is um, both the the sun, but it's the, the medium itself is the light. The, the medium of the light is the light. Uh, so we have the, the genus of, of experiencing light but we don't have this a particular species because in, in this, in this world, this body, we always experience in the mind, especially we only experience things as genus and species, right? I can't understand uh, sunlight unless I have a particular light hitting where I'm, where I'm at, <laughs> where I can see. So we have to have understand that. But in heaven, it's kind of like a, a theophanic light is, um, is God. Uh, but it, it still comes through uh, a mediation. There's still a mediation there. And so, uh, you know, that's why we can say that it's still a created faculty. And there's just nothing in, in Maximus or, or Dionysius that I can say, see that is that, um, you know, that the grace and experience is not some kind of mediated, i.e. created uh, mediation. Um, and then the last part of my dissertation, I look at uh, his mystagogia and look at uh, thurgy. Uh, and thurgy is a, a term that was used by the Neoplatonist schools, particularly Iamblichus and more, uh, and after him, Proclus. Um, and thurgy is basically uh, magical rituals and, and rites that you would practice to appease the gods to get the, the one to come down and do it. But it, uh, a lot of scholars assume that, oh, it's some kind of manipulation of the deities. But actually it was um, an invitation or enticement you do something that pleases the deities and they'll come down. Um, and this is why matter was so important because they thought that the, uh, the one could descend fully into matter and then raise matter up uh, to, to a unitive process. 
Um, and so for the for the Neoplatonists, uh, you know, they actually took matters seriously. And this is why I think it's so important that the Christians uh, kind of saw in this, right, an understanding of the body and soul. Maximus, Aquinas is a little bit thin on the body at the beatific vision, right? Um, that's one of the weaknesses, I think, in some of his theology, even though he does take a more Cyrillian Christology, there's still a bit of a weakness of um, the, the body and the beatific vision, but Maximus has the full body, full flesh, full soul, full spirit. Uh, everything is, is deified uh, through and through in the vision of God. And so um, he kind of maps that out, how God, Christ, is not only incarnated in the incarnation, but he's uh, there's all kinds of incarnations of Christ. He's in the logoi of the created world, uh, the principles and reasons for the whole created world. So that's why, as St. Paul says in Romans, you can look at the natural world and know that God exists. Um, and so he has a little mini incarnation, you know, in, in the created world. Uh, we can intuit Christ. Um, but then also in the church as the body of Christ. And then also in the, the, the Eucharist itself. It's also an incarnation. And so for Maximus, uh, the liturgy is this kind of recapitulation of the entire cosmos uh, and offering up to God. Um, so the holy sacrifice of the Mass is that. It's this recapitulation of, of everything, all, all the logoi, uh, through, the, through this Holy Spirit, uh, you know, in, in an ascent up. And so um, the hierarchy of the liturgy and the, even the arch it goes into the architecture, symbolism, and everything like that, which is really important. But with... Uh, kind of crucial for us, I think, in the West um, is this idea that uh, symbols are not some kind of extrinsic sign. So this is kind of the problem later on, especially after, with reformational theology and grace and nature understandings and Protestantism. Uh, grace kind of really starts becoming really extrinsic because we don't really get a lot of God here and now in this life. It's all you know for the afterlife that we get God, uh, whereas that's really not... The, the, the perennial Christian kind of understanding. Um, and it's because we kind of lost this uh, idea of, of deification. And so I think comparing Maximus and using his logos, his Christology uh, that he uses for the logos logoi, this kind of uh, Christological ontology uh, and his full uh, deification of the body and, and the soul together is really a compliment uh, for the West. And so he is a saint in the Western tradition, like he is a saint in the West. And so that's why I wrote the book, A Saint for East and West, is because there's something that Maximus has. Uh, even though he's not doing the same project as, as Aquinas per se, because you know in, in Neoplatonism they have the one, right? But then uh, Aquinas kind of replaces the one with uh, essay, uh, you know, being. Um, and so those are different approaches, but it doesn't mean that they're contradictory, right? And I think we can uh, pair that um, Eastern tradition before Palamas <laughs> uh, uh, with uh, with our Western kind of understandings. Um, and I guess the old an previous Anglican in me likes that because of the, the yeah. kind of that Celtic Celtic nature aspect. Yeah. Did, well, did did I understand you correctly when you were were you effectively saying that Maximus is in uh, unity with Benedictus Deus and the theology there, especially when it comes to the beatific vision and our knowledge of it. Oh, no, he says that we will have uh, not only full knowledge of ourselves, but we will have God fully. Um, um, now, he still kind of has that uh, distinction because, you know, at that period of time, you know, even in West, you know, Eastern thought too, you had this monism, right, where or this kind of um, Hindu atomatic idea of uniting with God, right? <laughs> uh, and uh, becoming one with, with, with God. And so that's there, you know, I think that that kind of ontological divide is still maintained, but there's no reserve uh, in the deification. Maximus doesn't have epic stasis. He doesn't have that um, kind of uh, vision of God, like a Gregory of Nyssa had. I th because I, I think that a lot of people would think that what's outlined in Benedictus Deus would be, contradictory to Maximus. That, that's just fascinating to hear. Okay. Um, in what way do you think? Well, I mean, in ben Benedictus Deus, mm -hmm. it, we we see the divine essence. But we often hear Maximus the Confessor presented as if we would never know the divine essence, never see it. Okay. 
Um, that's if you see Maximus as separating uh, God's action from his, his essence. Right. Um, even in the, his Trinitarian theology, um, he does kind of use this idea of uh, the principle or the, um, the essence and the mode of, of relationship. So we talk about in the West, we use relationality, right? That's, that's kind of the way that Trinitarian theology took place, but Maximus, the, the kind of mode, they're related uh, to each other in, uh, through, through the mode of existence. And so, um, it, but if you want to separate the mode from God, then I guess you could go that, you could see contradiction there. Uh, but I, I don't see Maximus doing that. There's nothing that uh, has this kind of cleaver uh, between uh, God and God. And, and um, in Ambiguum 7, you know, and also in uh, some of the other at the Lassium uh, passages in the Blower's book, Maximus does talk about uh, at the final vision, uh, there's no there's no remainder. Everything's not held back. Um, you know, God, we you know, fully have God. Um, but yet we, you know, we and, don't. And have, so far as we know, his essence. And so far as we know, his essence. Yeah. Hmm. Maybe I don't think not, he says not, that. Maybe not comprehensively, but mm -hmm. do we attain to a knowledge of his essence at all in in the idea of Maximus? It sounds like you're saying yes. Um, no, I would, I would be cautious about saying that, uh, I guess, because, mm -hmm. um, Max doesn't explicitly say that. So that's why I wouldn't yeah. want to affirm that. Um, he does talk about, we will know God become fully God and we'll know, uh, and see him fully, at, um, face to face and, and that kind mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but I think that since he says that, um, no being knows his own essence, or the meaning of his own essence, except for God. And then he said, but the end God will give us full knowledge of our, the principle of our being, our logoi. And he says, we'll have full knowledge of the logoi of all creation um, given to us uh, as God. And he doesn't say there's going to be anything held back from that. And yeah. So, I mean, I think that there's some room for some interpretation, um, mm. maybe some discussion there. Yeah. Eric, your thoughts. Yeah, one of the things I wanted to talk about was uh, how the Maximian trajectory got to the conclusion of the Palamite councils. Um, you know, Gregory Palamas seems to find something in uh, Dionysius and Maximus that he feels enabled to go full throttle. Right. With this, with this cleave, like what you were talking about, the cleave is between the essence and energies. Um, do you think that Palamas just took him? I, I, I mean, it, it, perhaps what an Orthodox might say if, if he were at our table here is, okay, I hear you. You know, um, perhaps I, uh, Maximus does not explicitly say. Uh, there's an ontological real distinction um, in that sense where there's, you know, a real duality between God's action and his right. essence. Um, but maybe Maximus, Maximus's ideas can't be understood without it. And so, you know, later Eastern theologians kind of supplied that to Maximus as a missing puzzle piece um, to finally make the full puzzle right. complete. Um, what do you think of that? Yeah. Um, honestly, I mean, prima facie, there are places in Maximus where I, you know, if I was just kind of looking at it without any other biases, <laughs> you know, coming to the table, or if I, I came to it from a culture that kind of had imbibed this theology of Palamite, I could see that. Um, and I could see you using some specific passages, but then when I tried to step back, I looked at, but is it congruent with his Trinitarian theology? Is it congruent with his fundamental ontology of the Logos Logoi, where there isn't a remainder, um, and, and there's no ontological space that's shared, not shared, right, um, in that sense? Um, it just seems weird that Maximus would have this different <laughs> metaphysics right. for this one, you know, for, for the doctrine of God. Yeah, it seems like it would have been a little bit more functional, right, in terms right. of his wording, too. And, yes. Um, yeah. I mean, and I think that the whole, you know, 
the imminent versus the economic uh, is also important here in the church fathers overall. Uh, I think you have to, you know, not press that too far. And yeah, Maximus, I, even I, at times, yeah. Maximus will say that, oh, this is just a, a, a notional uh, distinction that I'm making, right? And so, um, you know, you know, it, well, it, so so is this, this is a distinction as he's trying to just say, you know, I'm just trying to explain what this contemplation would be, God in his works. Um, what is what is heaven that's beyond time? Uh, how how does that work? Like, how, how can I picture uh, me as a creature existing in that, such a place, right? So I'd have to have some kind of different mode of being beyond my own nature to, uh, to do that. And, and, yeah. and so he's trying to put that in language. And it, I think he found the uh, the triads that the Neoplatonists were fond of using for everything, uh, which fit really well, right, with a Trinitarian Christian um, ontology. Um, yeah, I, I just I, I just see it maybe it's useful and like you said, functional um, for kind of describing yeah. it, but it doesn't necessarily get at uh, the the meaning and grounding behind that. Yeah, I think that like uh, the way that Gregory Palamas gets at in some of the passages where he talks about this, because, you know, one of the things that piques my interest, too, though, is that there is a passage in Palamas, and I, I wish I got it in my hands before we sat down for the broadcast. Sure. Because even he said that on the, I, there was one passage where he said that in God, wisdom, power, knowledge, all those things are still undifferentiated. And, you know, so that there's, he a, does, he does waffle sometimes. Right. So what I'm, yeah, is what I'm trying to say is that, you know, I've had the pleasure of talking to some folks uh, behind the scenes who are, you know, Palamites, um, but they recognize that the Neo-Palamites have sort of eclipsed a major sense of Palamite uh, theology in the sense that Palamas himself was a, uh, he did believe in God's simplicity. He right. was appropriate. He was appropriating this paradoxical um, God qua God, God qua S uh, activity that Maximus talks about. Um, and that he does have this strong sense of simplicity um, because otherwise it almost looks like uh, what I've heard from one fellow, uh, Lamblickian theurgy you know, um, what Palamas is doing with, you know, really trying to bring God so much into the created order and the material order that, uh, and this is where what's, I part. What's left in the afterlife? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and that's why, that's why, you know, I've always been so confused about uh, the way that Palamas is presented today is they almost make it out like the, the material motion is uncreated. And, and and so one with God, and that's just I can't ever go, I can't ever cross that bridge. But uh, you know, anyway, I, I I don't want to take the floor up too much with this. I know we probably have questions from the audience. Um, yeah, one of them is from Elijah. He asks, "What are your thoughts on the Scotus formal distinction?" Hmm. That is a tough one. Um, and I think y'all should get John Milbank on here uh, to answer that question in the future. Um, uh, Scotus, I understand the, uh, the formal distinction. Uh, there's kind of a question of whether um, it gets into the whole Franciscan idea of uh, heisitas, you know, that individual is what it is. And I can see the import of that because, uh, for, say, for instance, if um, if you die, right? <laughs> so you lose your body, but you still have your soul. So are you still... Uh, like, am I, would I still be Daniel if am I dying and my soul goes goes to heaven? If what makes me um, myself uh, in an individual uh, is my spatial temporal uh, you know, kind of component, so I could I could I could see that importance. But it, it gets a little bit um, tricky when you start putting that into uh, you know the divine, and, and Scotus will even kind of have that in the Trinitarian thought uh, as well. Um, which is a little bit problematic. Um, and he's so complicated too, that it's tough to say whether, um, if he means that more in a logical sense or uh, in a metaphysical sense. Um, so 
one of the problems is that you might have, um, this is one, a note actually I had from Milbank's article. Uh, so you can have divine intellection and Trinitarian emanations are secondary in formal terms to the absolute primacy of divinity in defining the divine nature. So you can kind of run into the same kind of problem we're talking about in Palamas, where you have the essence kind of above the Trinity. Um, if you have this formal distinction uh, in, in, in the Trinity, when you want to affirm infinity, well, it's infinity above the distinctions of the relations of the people, as, uh, the persons in the Trinity as well. So I guess it could be problematic, but there are people that are a lot smarter than me um, and have a lot more knowledge of Scotus's difficult Latin uh, than I do to, to be more efficient. I would also recommend uh, looking at Aaron Rich's work. Um, he was a PhD student uh, uh, at the same time in Nottingham I was studying under John and uh, he's now in Madrid, I think in Spain, but his dissertation was on uh, SCOTUS. Excellent. Now, th this other one is, how did Palamas come to dominate Eastern theology? Uh, he became uh, a, a bishop <laughs> uh, and head of a monastery for a while, um, and it was reinstated. I think he got the Turks uh, kidnapped him uh, at one point, and he got a ransom back. Um, but then when there were three councils uh, you know, in the East uh, from 1331 to 1347 in that time period. Uh, where they affirmed the Palamite. And he got called to debate because of this Hezekiah controversy. He got called to debate uh, Barlam, the Calabrian, uh, who was a Greek uh, theologian. And, um, and the problem is that Barlam actually uh, was more in the Scotus uh, metaphysics. And so uh, he was actually, I think, censured by uh, his archbishop when he came back <laughs> uh, uh, to, to Greece. But uh, yeah, and Palamas was able to kind of argue against him. So Palamas, he actually, he has some convincing uh, arguments in the triads when he's just kind of talking experientially, right? Uh, so he's trying to say, how can I experience this divine light? But then he also talks about, well, if these uh, divine lights that we're seeing in our contemplation are just created realities, then is there any substance to them? They're just phantasms. Like, you know, so they're just like a, a form that God creates, and then, but there's no substance to them. So are we really experiencing anything? Or is it just some kind of a virtual experience, right? Um, and so, you know, there's a certain kind of logic to that. And uh, if uh, Palamas had better rhetorical skills, he might have been able to dominate it. But I think the whole idea, and also uh, it didn't help that Barlam was accusing Palamas of messianism. He called him a mess messianite, <laughs> uh, which probably, you know, wasn't very helpful uh, uh, for, for Wayne debate kind of name calling because he it really wasn't. A messalian <laughs> uh, in, in, in that sense that's not what he was trying to do um right. but again just as neo-thomists um don't really represent thomas very well uh the neo-palamites i don't think represent gregory quite as well and i think there's enough actually in his works like eric you were talking about uh where he seems to kind of say something that's actually consistent with the more perennial <laughs> traditional christian right. saying and so um right. you know I, I don't know if he would press it that far um as, as it is today but Today, it's used as a, a way of distinction and separation, right? Yeah. Now. Well, I know that I think one of um, his uh, uh, theological, you know, um, sons, uh, 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 Scolarius, uh, Gennadius uh, Scolarius, uh, saw, he drew a line between Maximus uh, Palamas and Scotus, but... Uh, you know, I, I've not, I have no expertise in seeing that. You know, we have yeah. had Father Christian Caps on. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've seen, you've probably seen, familiar with his work. He's been on our show too, um, trying to defend that thesis. Yeah, and uh, it's like even in the um, the triads uh, book, uh, the editor cites that research was showing that there is this connection uh, with the Scotus uh, trajectory. Um, and that was in Barlam itself. Uh, so that, you know, it, uh, Gregory, even though I don't think he explicitly realized this, he, I think he was going that, that kind of direction. And then you can kind of see how uh, both in, in the West, you know, if you've ever read John Milbank's work, right, you know that the, this kind of um, formal distinction and SCOTUS, and then later the nominalist school that kind of came out of that, and the Montreux school, uh, are really kind of the foundations for 
well, everything, <laughs> uh, secularism and maybe even the Protestant Reformation in some sense, this idea of uh, exerting the will over everything else. Uh, there's one more here from Victoria. How does Dr. Haynes understand Maximus, who in Ambiguum 10 says grace is divine and uncreated, and right. in response to Thalassius uh, 6112 says that divinization is without origin? Right. All right. So in Ambiguum 10, that's one of the other silver bullets. Maximus talks about um, a reflection on Melchizedek, right? Um, and if you remember Melchizedek from the Old Testament, uh, it says he was without uh, gene genealogy, right? Um, and so Maximus kind of does a, a spiritual reading, right, of what this is. And so when he says uh, Melchizedek was without genealogy, Maximus says that uh, what he did was he was he contemplated his own logoi, and through asceticism and striving, he got to participate in um, the, the deifying lights and um, uh, life of God. Sorry, the divine life. And then he says he participated in that life, not the life that is in the breath, not the life that's in the, the blood pumping through your veins, but that divine life, the un, uncreated grace, right? And so it is interesting. He says uncreated uh, grace, uh, that he would have that kind of category. But again, um, for me, I don't try to anachronistically apply the grace nature divide in the West that's so emphasized back on Maximus. Um, if you think about, um, again, this Melchizedek kind of was getting towards this eschatological deification, right? And so uh, in the eschaton, uh, there's kind of this thing where time does kind of melt away or we become eternal. I don't know if time necessarily goes away. But it's the abode, uh, abode above time, uh, heaven. And it is a reality that is beyond our nature, but yet uh, we, we don't lose our nature. Our nature is not corrupted. Um, uh, Maximus always affirms that, that our, our nature is never corrupted. Our principle is never corrupted, but our mode of existence is transformed. So I think you have to kind of interpret in the same way. So whenever you see uh, these uncreated works of God or anything that seems to be on the other side of the ontological divide, I think it is God's bestowal of gifts uh, in eternity. Uh, on us. And so Maximus is trying to kind of reason out what is that? You know, it's a grace because it's obviously something that we can't do ourselves. Like I can't deify myself. Uh, and then when I'm in heaven, I don't have anything in myself that can deify myself. Maximus says this explicitly. And so you have to have God uh, who's doing the deification. Uh, and it has to be a full giving of himself. Um, and so that giving is a grace, but yet it's not in time, right? Uh, so I don't really have a, a problem uh, with, with the passage reading that uncreated grace in Maximus to say that, oh, well, that's obviously there's an energy there that's distinct from God's essence. But that is a really important, that's the only place in his corpus where he actually uses that expression, uncreated grace. So. That's, a, that's a really, um, that's a wonderful way of putting it. And it's thought provoking because um, when I, I studied a little bit on Palamas uh, mm -hmm. because Palamas even says, in uh, one of his works that there is a created grace um mm -hmm. yeah and and uh, yeah. i know so I, I, some, some I, energies I, are created and some aren't that's what's also right. confusing about palamas <laughs> yeah I, I i posted an article on on gregory palamas and created grace and mm -hmm. i got immediately got uh <laughs> I I immediately the got, yeah the calvary yeah. came uh, yeah. but uh even meindorf recognized that you know the effect inside the the like you were saying before maximus talks about the life of the blood here the life the 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 decision to love our neighbor the 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 influence on our will those things are created obviously they don't have a big it's not like they automatically get eternalized right but but uh you know that he does really think that god's pushing in something uncreated Right. And it, he calls it an infusion, even in some places of himself uh, into us. Right. So um, but that's also kind of wonderful. And, um, you know, the New Testament even says this. Right. We have the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You know, they come from outside of us and we have them. Uh, you know, Peter, uh, Second Peter 1, he talks about the, we participate in the divine nature. Right. Through the Holy Spirit. Right. So uh, it's it's 
there's nothing unchristian about all of this. <laughs> um, right. It's just that we're not used to talking about it in this way. And I, there's been a re revival of deification language and discussion in the West, which I think is very important and fruitful. Um, and I think reading church fathers, such as the Cappadocians and Dionysius and Maximus are um, really great to do that. But we don't have to multiply ontological realities in God uh, to have it if we want to affirm. Um, and the important aspect of the Neoplatonic vision is that the, the one, only the one can give because it is the one. You know, Dionysius uh, talks about God with this supra. He gives the supra ap, um, uh, prefix you know, for things. So it's something in excess of being. Um, and so it's something that is, is, is a, a going out of God. And um, the reason why the lower can participate in that and become deified is because of the one at the top, because God's at the top doing it. That's the only, only way it actually shares out. And that there is, um, for Christian theology, uh, what we call in philosophy donation, the, the gift is primary. Uh, God is love, right? God is pure gift. He's pure giving. And so um, having a radical paradoxical understanding of participation um, where uh, God is, is pure gift and we are to return that gift through our own uh, strivings, through the virtues, um, through loving our neighbor, <laughs> all these things, um, we return that. We return our principle to its source, as Maximus would say, um, and we, we kind of come back. Our end is where we began in God again. <clears throat> Dr. Haynes, I really want to, you know, thank you for coming on and doing this. I'd love to have you back on if you want to talk a little bit more about this topic or any, any others that are of interest right, sure. to you. Right. Yeah. I, I, I love metaphysics and uh, the church fathers and particularly essence and energy distinction was a big uh, part of my own, you know, personal uh, growth and things, trying to see God not as far away. Uh, but now you, you, you wrote this in 2012. I mean, that's uh, quite a long time ago. Since then, what are you dabbling in in terms of literature or maybe your own projects? Right. So um, and I did um, part of a project that's been kind of ongoing. I did publish an article in the Heathrop Journal in 2009 on um, radical orthodoxy and theosis, and, and and I kind of laid some of the groundwork, some of my ideas there about uh, how uh, we have to have this paradoxical understanding of participation in order to have theosis, um, and that theosis is a really important category uh, for the West to uh, re revive because it, it counteracts grace's extrinsic, uh, you know, to God and his nature, or extrinsic to us, that um, it's, it's not properly, because we, we so really want to have this ontological divide of grace and nature in the West. Uh, <clears throat> whereas the East, they didn't have a problem talking about nature is already graced in a way, right? And not just, um, uh, you know, um, prevenient grace, things like that, that we kind of categories we have in the West, but that, you know, God really is there. It's, it's not salvific, right? <laughs> but uh, nature is already primed and, and ready to receive God or else we couldn't participate in God. Um, and so that's just, a bit ongoing kind of a, an important thing. Also uh, looking at um, ontology and theosis for ethics. So the whole foundation for me for morality and social ethics, and that would include politics, um, is uh, hierarchical me mediation and participation um, metaphysics. And we've totally stripped that away uh, in, in the West, right? Um, uh, with our understanding of we took a scotus idea of freedom, uh, that freedom is unlimited, freedom is infinite, freedom is uh, license, right? Uh, it's not not the Augustinian restriction of freedom uh, as freeing us up to do the good, to, you know, to practice the virtues. And so uh, we, we really need that idea of participation in theosis um, as the foundation for our ethical understanding of, in politics as well. And that's uh, John Milbank's project, that, um, you know, kind of as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm his student, so I'm always trying to sure. take his. So I'm, I'm also um, I had a side project that I'm working on, looking at uh, technology and metaphysics um, in in a similar kind of way, uh, seeing what Neoplatonic philosophy might have our understanding of technology, what it is, how we use it. Um, Absolutely, 
I, I, as a cyber, <clears throat> I, I study a lot of cybersecurity. I see Neoplatonism everywhere. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, there's there's actually some dissertations written on like Plotinus and uh, technology. It's pretty, uh, it's really fascinating stuff. Um, yeah. I thought about doing a philosophy PhD and something like that in the future, but uh, mostly I've been trying to put food in the table and raise a family. Um, sure, and, sure. And, that kind of thing. and then of course in my teaching uh, at the college um, is you know comparative religions the survey courses, which are wonderful. I really enjoy. I love getting to introduce students to all, all these different kind of perspectives and um, and everything. But uh, you know I haven't really had a lot of time to do any like fun classes <laughs> in that sense where I could actually progress my own my own scholarship. But I've been doing a lot of more uh, practical ministry as well. Uh, within the ordinariate, I've started an apostolate. Um, and originally, when I was in the Anglican tradition, I was trying to start an order, uh, a lay order, um, focused on discipleship and trying to restore the life of the parish um, through um, bringing in that Anglican spirituality of the the, the Benedictine daily office, yeah. the rhythm of prayer and work. Um, oh, also of the it's uh, awesome the goodness of spirituality. So since churches and parishes, you know, we live such scattered lives away from our parishes. Um, we don't have that English village like we used to in the medieval right. period. So I've been trying to figure out um, you know, working with creating a, a formation program of discipleship that integrates um, what we do liturgically through the church at the parish uh, with small group um, formation uh, in homes that are regionally uh, drawn out around the parish, we have people that live in general areas to intentional communities, and you'd be studying topics like, say, you're coming up for the feast of the Annunciation. Well, you would study that in your your small group, and we're also starting classical uh, homeschool co-op academies uh, that would also uh, sink into that, and so it would be a, a full a full cycle of connection back into the parish, such that people living their lives out in the world can still in, in an embodied sense, not just through social media technology, but in an embodied sense. That's um, right. Discipleship um, and not just coming to church on Sunday and leaving. Well, again, thank you so much for coming on. I'd love to have you back on, especially for sure, a roundtable discussion. I think that that would be fun. That would be really great. It, it'd be awesome to have um, some, some uh, Orthodox scholars. Um, I have uh, some ideas. We'll we'll discuss them. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I, I really do think get a get a SCOTUS scholar that could really yeah. help with this because I think that's it's really important. The foundation for you know modern science, positivism, all these things. It, it comes back goes back to this medieval theology, um, and so it's something that's so crippled the West that um, I think really understanding that etiology is really important. Well, more to come on, uh, you know, uh, bringing Dr. Haynes back on. So everybody look forward to that. And thank you all for watching. Of course, don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. Also check us out, patreon.com forward slash reason at theology, where you will uh, get access to extra content and also support what we're doing here. And that'll do it. Everybody have a good weekend. Till next time. God bless. If you're looking to buy or sell a home, office, or any kind of property anywhere in the world, you're going to want to call Real Estate for Life, and they're going to connect you with a Catholic agent. Now, that agent will donate a portion of their commission upon sale, and Real Estate for Life will donate 75% of that gift to a pro-life organization at no cost to you. Call Real Estate for Life at 1-877-LIFE-US1 or text them 248-431-1440. If you care about the pro-life cause, call them now.